Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Perekrestov, the executive director of the Russian History Museum. And I just realized as we were preparing for this presentation that we are marking our one year anniversary of the second Saturday lectures. Thank you so much to all of you who have been joining us on this wonderful and sometimes bumpy ride. Um, this was a lifesaver for us during the pandemic to be able to share the stories, share our collection with all of you. And if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. I hope that this is the first of many, many lectures that you will attend with us. Um, as Hannah mentioned, the recordings of these lectures are posted on YouTube. So please tell your friends about the lectures. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, watch the recordings of our fantastic past lectures. And now I wanna move on to introducing today's speaker, Dr. Pamela Jordan. Uh, Dr. Pamela Jordan is Associate Professor of Politics and Global Affairs at Southern New Hampshire University. Before repatriating to the United States in 2011, she was an Associate Professor of History at the University of Saskatchewan. In addition to her book on Nadezhda Plivitskaya, uh, about which we will hear today, Dr. Jordan's publications include Defending Rights in Russia, Lawyers, the State, and Legal Reform in the Post-Soviet Era, and articles in numerous scholarly journal journals. Dr. Jordan has served as the Executive Director of the NGO Committee on Disarmament in New York City, and was a program assistant at the Kennan Institute for Advanced Russian Studies at the Wilson Center in Washington, DC. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jordan for today's, what I'm sure will be a dramatic presentation on the fascinating and tragic story of Nadezhda Plivitskaya, Stalin's singing spy. So as we explore Plavitskaya's life between the early 1800s and 1940, we'll encounter various historical contexts and themes. These will include the late Tsarist era, especially Russia's rich folk music tradition and its early musical entertainment industry. How the dramatic events of World War I, the Bolshevik Revolution, and the Civil War transformed Russian society and the many difficulties that Russian emigres faced in navigating life in interwar Europe. So here's our history puzzle for today. Nadezhda Plavitskaya performed for over three decades to adoring audiences in Russia, Europe, and the United States. She claimed to be foremost a singer for all people, regardless of, of their ideological leanings or class backgrounds. Uh, she said she was always fundamentally apolitical. Yet in 1937, while living in exile in France, Plavitskaya and her then husband, white Russian General Nikolai Skoblin, were unmasked as Stalin's secret agents for their role in kidnapping a fellow Russian emigre in Paris. She was compared to Matahari, the notorious Dutch exotic dancer and femme fatale whom the French, the French executed in 1917 as a German spy. Why then would Plavitskaya and Skoblin betray their tight-knit Russian emigre community? Their story was difficult to reconstruct using archival resources and memoirs, largely because they were spies, but also because of the many rumors about them. So let's start at the very beginning with Plavitskaya's childhood and with a map of Russia. According to church records, Plavitskaya was born in 1879 to peasant parents who lived in a village called Vinikova. Vinikova was located about 25 miles from Korsk in the agricultural region of Southwestern Russia near the Ukrainian border. And you can see uh, from the map, uh, I've indicated where it is. So you may already be familiar with Kursk as the site of the pivotal 1943 World War II battle, but it's also an area with a rich folk music tradition. Plavitskaya's birth name was in fact Vinikova in honor of her home village, and she was nicknamed Djeshka by her family. Djeshka then grew up in a typical peasant hut much like this one in the drawing that's on exhibit at the museum named in her honor in Vinikova that opened up in 2009. Plavitskaya's mother, Akulina, was very pious, 
Uh, she was very resourceful, intelligent, and illiterate, like most uh, peasant women at the time. She was traditional in outlook, including about gender roles. Plavitskaya's father, Vasily, served in the Tsar's army. Djezhka worshipped her father, but sadly he died at a very, when she was still very young. Uh, so it's no coincidence, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, that three of her four major romantic partners were military officers. So Djezhka was the youngest of 12 children, only five of whom survived childhood. Her only formal education was in the village school and lasted barely three years between the ages of nine and 12. And in these family photos, you can see on the left um, is her sister Masha Maria Masha with Masha's two children, and then Akulina uh, on the right. Uh, and then in the photo on the right is, uh, you can see Plavitskaya around 1912, uh, very much dressed to the nines, a, a wealthy woman by then on the far left with three sisters on, uh, on the right. So due to her strong drive for personal fulfillment and artistic expression, Dieshka challenged the dead end cycle of illiteracy, drudgery and poverty that trapped many peasant girls in late Tsarist Russia. From an early age, she performed with other village children in a form of singing and ring dancing that was popular in the Kursk region called Karagod. In her 1920s memoirs, Plavitskaya muses, how can one not be transported by the joyful surges of songs? I am carried from Karagod to Karagod. But Djezhka was prohibited actually from singing in the male only choir in the village church. And she writes in her memoirs that this prohibition motivated her to seek different pastures outside of Vinikova. By age 14, the strong-willed Yeshka had rejected her mother's advice to become a farm wife. Initially, she agreed to train as a nun at this Kursk convent, which is still in operation today. Uh, but she soon grew bored. Soon after that, uh, she left the convent and worked in a circus briefly, but Aquilina, her mother, forced her to leave. Then she worked for a time as a domestic servant for a wealthy uh, merchant in Kursk. But that was all. She said she would never work as a servant again. At around age 18, Djezhka began to pursue her true calling, that of a singer in the range of a mezzo-soprano. She joined small performance groups, first in Kiev, where a sister of hers lived, and then performed more widely across southwestern Russia. She took the name Plavitskaya in 1902 upon marrying her first husband, as you can see in the photo, Edmund Plavitsky, who was a Polish ballet dancer. They met in Kiev when he was touring as a member of Stein, a performance group that Plavitskaya later joined, and he taught her how to dance uh, mazurkas and other um, dances. So unfortunately, they divorced in 1912 after they had grown apart, and Plavitskaya later met her or had, had met her uh, next love interest. However, they did stay in touch. Uh, really until um, the time of uh, the Mueller kidnapping in 1937. There's a contested rumor that she may have given birth to a child with Plavitsky, but I found no documented evidence of this child. Between 1910 and 1920, Plavitskaya was Russia's best known and wealthiest female folk singer. Recordings of her songs, including nearly 20 folk songs from Kursk that she had helped arrange, sold by the tens of thousands. She was especially appreciated for her dramatic and expressive style of storytelling, augmented by folk costumes. She gained a national reputation as a singer in a popular variety show format called Estrada. Choirs and soloists performed a diverse assortment of songs from popular urban tunes to folk and gypsy numbers and were joined by virtuoso musicians on folk instruments. 
By the early 20th century, Estrada had become an intrinsic part of the new commercial industry that linked together gramophone recordings, mass audiences, films, and popular entertainment magazines and newspapers in which Plavitskaya, a major celebrity, often appeared. Plavitskaya quickly rose to fame after being discovered, quote unquote, by a renowned tenor, Leonid Sabinov, while performing at a regional fair in Nizhny Novgorod in October 1909. The following March, 1910, she sang in a command performance for Tsar Nicholas II in the beautiful Alexander Palace in Tsarskoye Selo, uh, which is uh, better known in our day as Pushkin, a town outside of St. Petersburg. The Tsar reportedly called her the Kursk Nightingale and awarded her eventually with the distinction of People's Singer. She performed for Nicholas and his family several more times. Her most treasured royal gift was a diamond brooch in the shape of the two-headed Russian imperial eagle. Did she and the czar have an affair, as was rumored? Um, in terms of my own search uh, for any evidence, I found none, and I assumed that they did not have an affair. After her command performance for the czar, she performed at the Moscow Conservatory, the Great Hall of the Moscow Conservatory, and she was the first folk singer to do so. Alexander Benoit, one of the most prominent painters to design sets for the Ballet Russe in Paris, described Plavitskaya as a performer who, quote, enchanted everyone from the monarch to his least distinguished subject by her typically, typical Russian beauty and the vividness of her talent. Pioneering film director, Sergei Eisenstein, said that her singing helped shape his entire aesthetic. In 1913, Plavitskaya performed in a concert with the great bass virtuoso, Fyodor Chulyapin, in the Marinsky Theater in St. Petersburg, which the royal family attended. Audiences felt that Plavitskaya interpreted folk songs authentically and symbolized the eternal soul of the Russian people. She typically appealed to their sense of national identity and sentimentalized views of village life in Russia's peasant heartland. Her overall message comforted and reassured her urban audiences that they still shared common values in the midst of modernity's growing decadence and fracturing. In 1914, Plavitskaya began to devote more time to performing folk songs from the Kursk region and more often appeared on stage in peasant dress, as you see on the left. Some of her costumes, though, and some of her concerts resemble clothing worn in the pre-imperial era by women in the noble boyar class, as you can see in the photograph on the right. And she often, often appeared too in these publicity shots um, with uh, using certain hand gestures like this. Um, so uh, that became one of, one of her typical poses over time. Plavitskaya reflected on her own celebrity in her memoirs. She writes that in life, I knew two joys, the joy of artistic glory and the joy of the soul achieved through suffering. The first joy passes while the soulful one brings joy to the end of, of your days, she writes. So she once joked, I love the crowd, but only when I'm on stage. So whenever she grew tired of performing, as she often did, because she had quite, um, a busy concert schedule and recording schedule. She visited her sprawling dacha in Vinikova. And you can see a photograph here, a family photo of it being under construction in 1911. So Plavitskaya is in the middle there with two of her sisters playing croquet. Uh, and reportedly the dacha um, was destroyed by a fire during World War II and around uh, 1942. So getting back to her story then, um, move on here. Uh, in, um, she, she had hoped to be able to retire to her dacha in Vinikova, but unfortunately that was not to be. So let's move on to World War I. 
During World War I, Plavitskaya served as a nurse in field hospitals and sang for Russian soldiers and officers in concerts and for the wounded at, her, at their bedsides. In her memoir, she writes, sometimes my songs were prescribed like medicine. As Hubertus F. John writes in his book, Patriotic Culture in Russia During World War I, Plavitskaya's songs reflected a mood of retreat into the shell of a secure communal identity, and at the same time, a hesitant hope for victory. She experienced personal loss during World War I. Her fiance, an army officer named Vladimir Shangin, a cousin to the Tsar, was killed in East Prussia in January 1919, followed by the death of her mother, Akulina, later in the year. During the summers of 1915 and 1916, Plavitskaya found a new outlet for her sorrow. She acted in two films, The Power of the Land and The Cry of Life. They were produced by Russian filmmaker Vladimir Gardin on her Vinikova estate. During the late summer and fall of 1917, Plavitskaya based herself in the Kursk area and she traveled occasionally to Crimea for concerts during this revolutionary period. She reportedly was in Vinikova the day of the Bolshevik revolution. At this watershed moment for the country, a major development in her life occurred. Early November in Vinikova's Trinity Church, Plavitskaya, who was at this point in her late thirties, married a 25 year old Lieutenant in the Imperial Army named Yuri Levitsky. Now recall that Plavitskaya always insisted she was apolitical and she performed for all people regardless of their class background or ideology. Unfortunately for the civil war years, there's little reliable information on her political allegiances, her exact movements or the people with whom she fraternized. She seems to have calculated that her best chance for survival and everyone was thinking about survival was to earn income for performing or by performing for both red and white audiences in Southern Russia and Ukraine, which were of course major war theaters. As you can see from this map, I've, I've included Kursk here roughly where Kursk is. And um, so Kursk changed hands between the whites and the reds uh, during the civil war years. Uh, and um, so she was, uh, uh, performing in concerts down around here and eventually migrated to Crimea, as I'll talk about in a moment. According to some journalists and white Russian emigre sources, she was already serving as an agent of the Bolsheviks' first secret police, the Cheka, during this time, including in Odessa and Kursk, although we cannot know for certain. The Cheka did not keep archival records of their many informants and jailers, and no Soviet official later admitted that she had played these roles. What we do know is that her second husband, Levitsky, defected to the Reds sometime in 1918 and commanded a Red Army unit, possibly for over a year. Then in 1919, he and Plavitskaya were captured by the whites near Korsk. After their capture and redefection to the whites, Plavitskaya soon separated from Levitsky, we don't know exactly why, and stayed close to white army encampments. By March 1920, white army commanders were forced to retreat into Crimea. General Anton Denikin resigned his leadership post in April and General Pyotr Wrangel replaced him. By 1920 then, Plavitskaya, who was now around 40 years old, had also migrated to Crimea where she performed for white army troops. She and a young major general named Nikolai Vladimirovich Skoblin reportedly met that autumn, 1920, in a hospital in Simferopol in Crimea where he was recovering from battle wounds. So that's yeah, somewhere around here. <laughs> Um, so Skoblin would become her third and last husband after she and Levitsky divorced in 1921. So a little bit about Skoblin, a little bit more about Skoblin. Skoblin was about 12 years Plavitskaya's junior and was born in 1893 in Nezhin, which is about 90 miles northeast of Kiev. 
He served in the Russian Imperial Army during World War I and was actually awarded the orders of St. George and St. Vladimir for valorous behavior in battle. During the Civil War, Skoblin fought in the Kornilov Shock Regiment of the Volunteer Army in Southern Russia. For those of you who might not be familiar, shock regiments like his were used in frontal assaults and surprise attacks against enemy defenses, obviously against the Reds. Skoblin was one of the youngest generals in the volunteer White Army. He had a mixed reputation though, and was later accused by a handful of his fellow White Army officers of serving as a Bolshevik informant on Plavitskaya's urging as early as 1920. Skoblin would become her third and last husband after she and Levitsky divorced in 1921. Right. Uh, so you can see here, it's kind of interesting, uh, the shoulder patch from his regiment here, and uh, it is in the collection of the Russian History Museum, the uh, Holy Trinity Orthodox Seminary and Archive in Jordanville. New York, which I visited uh, 11 years ago for my research. And then you can see this statuette here of um, a regimental soldier uh, wearing that same patch. So it's kind of interesting to see um, these connections. So um, moving on then to a life in exile. In November 1920, Wrangel's 146,000 plus forces and their families fled from Crimea in allied ships, including US destroyers, uh, and landed in Constantinople, Turkey, poor and stateless. Plavitskaya and Skoblin were among them. Plavitskaya was only one of many cultural figures who left Russia during the first wave of emigration, roughly between 1917 and 1922. This list includes these uh, luminaries, Mark Chagall, Fyodor Shalyapin, Irene Nemirovsky, Sergei Prokofiev, Sergei Rachmaninov, and Nikolai Rurik. Um, many of them at this time, when they left Russia, they struggled to assimilate into the culture of their newly adopted countries. Shalyapin left Russia in 1921, and like Plavitskaya, he never stopped feeling homesick. He writes in his memoirs, how could I give up that country where I had not only compassed all that one can see and feel here and or see and touch, hear and feel, but where I had dreamed dreams and enshrined my deepest longings, especially in the years that preceded the revolution. Plavitskaya writes in her memoirs, in a foreign land feeling an immense homesickness, one joy remained, my quiet thoughts about the past, my homeland is far away and our happiness remains there. Unlike Chaliapin and others, however, other, unlike other em Russian emigre artists, Plavitskaya tied her life to the rem remnants of the defeated white army forces through her relationship with Skoblin, who served as commanding officer of the Kornilov Shock Regiment in exile. And you can see a photograph of them here uh, on Gallipoli with Skoblin in the front row and a portrait of the now deceased General Kornilov, after whom the regiment was named. So for white army veterans, the successful evacuation from Crimea and the first year of exile in Turkey served during the rough times ahead as vital symbols of honor and collective identity. Plavitskaya and Skoblin camped with the other white army veterans on the peninsula of Gallipoli in, until 1921. After receiving strong criticism for living together in a tent out of wedlock, they wed in a ceremony on Gallipoli in June 21 in the presence of uh, General Alexander Kuchipov, Skoblin's superior, and other top officers. Plavitskaya performed regularly in the White Army encampment there, and for years to come, the soldiers of Skoblin's Kornilov Regiment addressed Plavitskaya as their so-called mother commander. And you can see here, uh, kind of marking the significance of their time on Gallipoli. This is a photograph of a Gallipoli cross uh, that is also in um, the Holy Trinity Orthodox Seminary and Archive, the Russian History Museum in Jordanville. And this is a photograph of uh, some white army officers 
um, in uh, Bulgaria, where they where many of them went, including the Scoblins. You can see um, Scoblin here in the second row, and then his commander Khuchapov in the first row, uh, where they were stationed uh, between 1921 and 1924. Uh, in Bulgaria, basically living in pretty crude conditions in army barracks. Uh, so it was in 1924 then that Skoblin and Plavitskaya moved to uh, France, where they stayed. Uh, and they tended to live mainly in and around Paris. Of all the European countries during the 1920s, France was the most open to Russians. And Paris was the epicenter of the Russian emigration. Most Russian emigres struggled to survive financially in exile. Female aristocrats sold jewelry uh, to pay for food and lodging. Many male emigres either worked in factories or often drove taxis for a living. So uh, the Russian emigre communities in France tried hard to maintain their cultural heritage. They built and operated various performance venues like Dome Artista, Artista uh, House of the Artists, which had exhibition halls and per performance venues. And then of course, uh, beautiful Russian Orthodox churches, um, including, uh, as you can see in this photograph, Alexander Nevsky, Russian Orthodox Cathedral in Paris, which was built, I believe, as early as 1861. Plavitskaya became a cherished symbol of the anti-white movement in exile and had no desire to assimilate into society, into French society. This colorful painting of her was completed by Russian emigre artist Philippe Meliavin in 1924, and it was unveiled and at an exhibit in Paris the following year. So in the 1920s and the 1930s in exile then, Plavitskaya earned income through her concert tours of Europe and the United States. And uh, was almost always the case in that a performance would include her torch song, which was Russia, you're frozen in snow, Zemilo Tibya Snegum Russia. And uh, the melancholy chorus ran Russia, you're frozen in snow, holed up by a gray blizzard, and cold winds blow across the steppe. Requiems are sung over you. So this was something that brought tears to the eyes of, um, of Russian emigres as they thought back to their life in their homeland. Uh, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, Plavitskaya's concert tour of the United States, uh, which took place uh, between kind of mid-1926 to early 1927. And uh, when I was at the Bakhmetov archive at, um, in the Butler Library at Columbia University in the Filinenko file, which was of her defense attorney, um, I came across scrapbooks that she herself had put together of various concert tours with lots of uh, newspaper clippings and uh, programs. And so she had a separate scrapbook of her uh, concert tour in the United States, which included uh, many concerts in the New York City area, Springfield, Massachusetts, <laughs> Philadelphia, and Detroit, which all had, of course, sizable Russian emigre communities at the time. A reporter for a Russian emigre newspaper, probably the most famous one in the United States, New Russian Word, Novaya Ruskoye Slovo noted at the time, there is no one among the Russian emigration who had not known Plavitskaya, who would not have remembered her singing. Now the old Russian colony, peasants and workers are coming to hear their own djeshka. Uh, so um, I wanted to, after I talk a little bit about uh, Sergei Rachmaninoff, um, we're going to be playing a short excerpt from one of her songs. Uh, so Sergei Rachmaninoff, who of course, as, as many of you know, uh, emigrated to the United States, accompanied her on piano at one New York concert, which movie star Gloria Swanson attended. Uh, and uh, a week or so after that, uh, in a Manhattan 
recording studio, Plavitskaya recorded a version, a version of the darkly humorous song, Powder and Paint, Vilelitsi Ruminanitsi Wimoy. It was arranged by Rachmaninoff, who also accompanies her on piano. The song is about a young woman who wears cosmetics and flirts with a single man at a public feast which uh, makes her fearful that her jealous husband who arrives on the scene will whip her. So let's listen to this example of Klavitskaya's dramatic expressive speech and storytelling ability. So moving on, uh, back in Europe, and as time passed, Plavitskaya coped poorly with life in exile, especially as her health deteriorated and her music failed to attract wider audiences beyond Rush the Russian emigration. She reportedly had kidney disease and suffered from anxiety attacks as she aged. Meanwhile, Skoblin remained active in white Russian military veterans associations, including the most prominent group, the Russian General Military Union, in Russian, Ruski Obchi Vyensky Soyuz, or ROVES, which is the acronym we'll use. ROVES was headquartered in Paris, and you can see this photograph of where it was headquartered in downtown Paris. This was the, the uh, door opening, and then they were in the first floor, as the, as the French say, this is the first floor. Uh, and um, but there were branches, robes branches worldwide throughout Europe uh, and worldwide. General Rangel founded robes in September 1924, uh, which was only one month before the French government established diplomatic ties with the Soviet Union. Rangel had envisioned robes with himself as commander in chief, and he, and he died in 1928 as an umbrella organization capable of gathering together disparate groups of white army veterans. Once functioning, ROVES would offer useful services to veterans, including job assistance, hospital care, free dinners, and rail passes. The need for such enticements at this time was acute. By 1924, several white officers had returned to Soviet Russia, potentially weakening the will of those who remained. Providing for the well being of white army veterans was an important way to persuade them to remain abroad. Beyond this, the primary goal of ROVES, which also trained young recruits as soldiers, was to overthrow the Soviet regime. However, ROVES lacked the financial and material resources, including from Russian, or including from Western governments, to accomplish their goal. And the Soviets consistently outmaneuvered them. During the 1920s, the Soviet secret police, at the time called OGPU, o -G -P -U, but later in 1934 renamed the NKVD, recruited dozens of Soviet agents among Russian emigres and tried to under undermine any attempts to overthrow the Russian regime. I mean, the Soviet regime. The Soviets viewed so-called white guardists, like Rove's members in particular, as terrorists and knew they regularly cooperated with foreign intelligence agencies, carried out anti-Soviet sabotage operations inside the USSR, and were supporting a white army in exile. In Europe, the Soviets' most routine counterintelligence tasks involve monitoring these white guardist organizations like ROVES in order to steal their secrets, feed them disinformation, and weaken them from within by using so-called agent provocateurs. Now, reportedly, Stalin and Soviet intelligence officials knew that the president of Rove's after Wrangel's death in 1928, General Kuchipov, shown here in this photograph, was planning sabotage operations inside the Soviet Union. In their minds, eliminating him would help neutralize a dangerous threat and perhaps precipitate the collapse of the white Russian military apparatus. In fact, in January 1930, Ogpu Soviet operatives kidnapped General Kuchipov in broad daylight on the streets of Paris. Kuchipov reportedly was killed while still in France. Some members of the Russian emigre community at the time suspected already that 
Klebitskaya and Skoblin were involved in the kidnapping, but there is no clear evidence that this was the case, although it's possible. After Kuchibov's uh, kidnapping, the next head of Rove's was his former deputy, General Miller. General Yevgeny Miller. General Miller was already 62 years old and in failing health. He was of medium build and had piercing blue eyes and a prominent mustache. Miller was conscientious and courageous, felt a strong call to duty, and was a loyal friend and family man. He did not rush to judgment. Normally, this was a positive attribute that in his case would prove fatal. During the Civil War period, he commanded the White Army of the North. In 1920, with his army defeated, he evacuated to Norway first and then settled in France. Miller and his wife, Natalia, pictured here with him, met the Scoblins in Paris in 1927, but they did not grow friendlier until after Miller became head of Rove's in 1930. And as you can see in this photograph, on the right, uh, there is Scoblin in the background, kind of ominously lurking in the background. So to his detriment, Miller never built a counterintelligence apparatus strong enough to defend Rove's and guard his safety. In addition, to prevent French authorities from dismantling Rove's for violating public order, he had to deny the existence of military planning and anti-Soviet operations. During the 1930s, the French came to view Russian emigres as a criminally and politically suspect immigrant population in need of more policing. As I found in uh, French government files, Miller himself served as a police informant for the French. Worst of all, Miller stubbornly continued to trust Skoblin even after other white army officers warned him with evidence that his subordinate was a Soviet spy. A growing number of Russian emigres suspected that the Skoblins had a secret funding source and wondered how they could afford to own several cars and a house in a neighboring Paris suburb uh, on Plavitskaya's meager concert earnings. Yet Miller empowered Skoblin, his subordinate, by appointing him as head of the Gallipoli Society in Paris in 1933, and then in 1935 as a leader of Rove's counterintelligence unit called the Inner Line. By that year, 1935, the Paris police already were suspecting that Skoblin and Plavitskaya had ties to Soviet intelligence. The following year, 1936, Miller did begin to suspect Skoblin's treachery uh, after the Finnish Rove's Finnish collaborators warned him that someone close to him was likely a Soviet agent, but Miller still gave Skoblin the benefit of the doubt. According to declassified Soviet secret police documents, nine months after Kuchipov's abduction, in September 1930, Skoblin and Plavitskaya agreed to be recruited by the Soviets. The use of married couples was a standard part of Soviet intelligence tradecraft. Think of the Rosenbergs. This arrangement recognized the basic fact that couples tend to share information and can already function as a team. Typically, the husbands were given more crucial tasks than their wives, who tended to act as their husband's helpmates. This was the situation with Plavitskaya and Skoblin. The Skoblins, of course, had motives to spy. Like other Russian emigres, they faced increasing financial problems while living abroad. Skoblin felt animosity towards several senior Rove's officers. As early as the 1920s, General Vrangel and Denikin had accused him of insubordination and treachery. Plavitskaya, for her part, was suffering from homesickness and did not feel she could ever assimilate into French culture. The Soviets offered her and Skoblin uh, money, a way to return home and personal amnesties, but only after they first proved themselves loyal to the regime and worthy as spies. As fulfilling or in fulfilling their tasks for Soviet intelligence, Skoblin and Plavitskaya simply remained in place, deceiving those around them. 
Scoblin was the principal agent in the pair, his status as a leader of a white Russian regiment and his close ties to Rhodes's Paris headquarters made him an ideal target for Soviet recruitment. He was well positioned to influence Rhodes's operations and identify additional targets for Soviet recruitment. The Soviets had hoped that someday he would replace Miller. In fact, Skoblin did prove his worth to the Soviets. He exposed nearly 20 Rhodes agents before they crossed into the Soviet Union, provided his Soviet handlers with copies of secret Rhodes documents about planned anti-Soviet operations, and he exposed to the Soviets Rhodes plans to aid General Franco's forces during the Spanish Civil War. As an agent provocateur, Skoblin provoked further disharmony within an already faction-riddled Rhodes organization. For her part, Plavitskaya, seen here in the photograph in the center uh, with uh, Skoblin behind her there with uh, some, um, a group of Russian emigres who were in Estonia in the 1930s, most likely. Uh, so for her part, uh, Plavitskaya was tasked with creating a good name for herself in Skoblin by means of her performances at emigre gatherings like this one in Estonia, and by reporting on major developments in emigre circles. She provided cover for Skoblin, who accompanied her on concert tours as her manager, but used these trips for meeting with his Soviet handlers and for collecting more information on Rhodes' secret anti-Soviet operations. At times, she also uh, performed clerical tasks, such as when she reportedly, according to NKVD files, helped Skoblin copy by hand a top secret Rhodes report on plans to invade the Soviet Union that they then passed on to Skoblin's Soviet handler. By late 1936, Skoblin, Plavitskaya, and other agents had passed the NKVD enough information to convince the Soviets that General Miller and Rhodes were designing more lethal anti-Soviet operations, including plans now to collab uh, collaborate with the Nazis in an eventual war with the USSR. In early 1937, Stalin and his henchmen devised an elaborate plot to kidnap General Miller and return him to Russia, this time alive. The plot involved at least 10 operatives, including Skoblin and Plavitskaya. On the afternoon of, of September 22, 1937, Skoblin lured General Miller to a building on the outskirts of Paris that was leased by the Soviet embassy. Once inside, Miller was abducted by a team of NKVD operatives, drugged, forced into a crate, and then onto a truck that drove to La Havre, where Miller was placed on a Soviet vessel that sailed to Soviet Russia. After Skoblin handed off Miller to these operatives, his job was done. Plavitskaya's role was to support Skoblin's alibi in the event they were ever questioned. So Plavitsky and Skoblin would have worked out ahead of time with other Soviet op operatives or their, their handler ahead of time, their elaborate schedule for that day, which involved lunch at a nearby cafe, a visit to the dress to a dress shop, and seeing someone off at a train station, actually the daughter of General Kornilov. Unfortunately for the Skoblins, a key piece of evidence undermined their alibi. On the morning of his disappearance, uh, Miller had wisely left a note with a subordinate named General Pavel Kuzansky. In his note, Miller wrote that Skoblin was accompanying him to a secret meeting with two German officials, but that he suspected it could be a trap. It took 11 hours after the meeting before Miller's bungling assistants, including Kusatsky, read his letter. At around 1.30 a.m. that night, another one of his assistants came by Skoblin's and Plavitskaya's hotel room to order him to Rove's headquarters for questioning about his knowledge of Miller's meeting. Skoblin willingly left the hotel room while Plavitskaya remained behind, a decision that would come to haunt her. Once at Rove's headquarters, Skoblin lied about his knowledge of Miller's meeting. When he got the chance, he fled from the building and vanished into the night, instead of accompanying his comrades to a police station as planned. 
No Rove's members or Plavitskaya ever saw Skoblin again. Reportedly, after lying low in the Soviet embassy in Paris for a few days, he was most likely flown to Spain and killed there by the NKVD. After all, it was the height of Stalin's great terror. Sadly, declassified NKVD files reveal that the Soviets executed Miller under the pseudonym Ivanov, as you can see in the photograph on the left, in Moscow in May 1939, because he was no longer seen as useful to Stalin's regime in the lead up to World War II. Within hours of learning about Miller's disappearance, Russian emigres and Paris investigators, who of course had no idea what really happened to Miller other than he disappeared and he was probably kidnapped by the Soviets, uh, had suspected that the Soviets had planned and executed his kidnapping and that the Skoblins were involved. With Skoblin's disappearance, Plavitskaya became the only suspect to be arrested. The police arrested her three days after Miller's kidnapping, after she had roamed Paris for two days, presumably looking for Skoblin. In detention at a woman's jail in Paris called Le Petit Roquette, Plavitskaya grew depressed over her separation from Skoblin. She suffered from heart problems, headaches, and insomnia, according to her prison diary. It was rumored that she had received notes and postcards from Skoblin before he was killed in order in, in which he urged her not to confess in order to protect him and promised that they would soon be reunited, which of course they never were. Plavitskaya was charged with conspiracy to kidnap Miller, a crime that could lead to life imprisonment. She was not the first Soviet spy to be tried in France, actually. In 1935, 23 Soviet agents were convicted of espionage in Paris and given prison sentences of up to five years. However, Plavitskaya was not charged with espionage. Why? Politics. The Soviet government vigorously denied its involvement in the Miller operation at the time, of course. Uh, France's government, uh, on its part, needed to remain on friendly terms with the Soviets due to their national security concerns over Nazi Germany. The French government tried to conceal the fact that its Navy had allowed the Soviet ship carrying Miller to escape French territorial waters on its return to the Soviet Union. Because of these political considerations then, French investigators were compelled to remain quiet for the most part about the Soviet embassy's participation in the Miller kidnapping and to focus instead on the Skoblins as the perpetrators of the crime. By the end of the investigation, which lasted until the fall of 1938, the police had collected over 1,300 pounds of documents, many of them coming from uh, Skoblin's own home office. Uh, and uh, the investigation dossier contained 2,500 pages, including statements from 150 witnesses and Plavitskaya herself. So you can see this uh, photograph that I took from a Russian Astankina television documentary that she was able to accompany the investigators along with her defense attorneys to her Paris uh, suburban home while the investigators carted out boxes and boxes of documents um, from Skoblin's office. Now, these documents were for um, mostly uh, then came from his um, time as a uh, leader of the inner line, uh, Rose's counterintelligence um, arm, uh, rather than uh, Soviet documents. Um, but in any case, uh, at this time then during the investigation, and as I'll talk about it in trial, uh, Plavitskaya liked to portray herself as a simple peasant woman, a baba who knew nothing and really just cared about tending her garden and caring for her pets and her chickens uh, at, at her home outside of Paris. So moving on, uh, Plavitskaya's nine-day nine jury trial occurred in December 1938 in the imposing Palace of Justice and lasted nine days. 
Plavitskaya being a foreigner, a stage performer, and a suspected spy were, of course, strong marks against her. Simultaneously, she was being sued in a civil case by Miller's family, including his courageous wife, Natalia, who had cooperated with investigators. Plavitskaya's trial was covered extensively in major European newspapers. Some observers called it the trial of the century, and it was the last time that Russian emigre uh, affairs drew so much of the French public's attention. Um, so journalists, of course, dubbed her La Plavitskaya, as, um, as it says at the top of this article in the socialist newspaper Le Ouvre uh, that uh, covered the first day, day of her trial. It says, um, and the, the uh, headlines, will the Russian singer and likely double agent uh, deliver her secret? Yesterday during the first hearing at her trial, she fiercely defended herself from being aware of her husband's actions. How do you explain yourself? Asked the trial judge when your husband had the cowardice to let you appear alone today. And Plavitsky answered, Niznayo, I do not know. Uh, so a little bit more about journalists. Uh, so uh, they dubbed her then a red seductress who masterminded Miller's kidnapping and used her feminine wiles to pressure her young husband into, a, uh, into becoming a Soviet agent. The prosecutor at the trial compared her to a siren who lured sailors to their doom. In their rush to paint her as a red femme fatale like Mata Hari, Plavitsky's accusers actually exaggerated her role in the kidnapping and her influence over the way it unfolded. Many suspected wrongly, as we now know, that Plavitsky had even masterminded it. Journalists who were pro-Soviet argued that the Germans or the Spanish had kidnapped Miller and that the Skoblins were not involved. Basically, it was a big media circus. Plavitskaya appeared in court dressed as a widow in black with a veil, but she also portrayed herself as she had during the investigation as a helpless, wrongly accused and barely literate Baba whose childhood in a Russian village formed her character and outlook. A police commissioner named Jean Belen in his memoirs later admitted, we did not have any formal proof of Plavitskaya's complicity in this affair. Despite this lack of tangible proof, though, the circumstantial evidence indicating Plavitskaya's support for Skoblin's alibi was compelling. This includes the discrepancies between her testimony and that of over a dozen witnesses who had seen the Skoblins on the day of Miller's kidnapping. It includes financial evidence that Skoblin and Plavitskaya's spending exceeded that of the reported income. The prosecutor suggested that one of Plavitskaya's benefactors, Russian emigre psychoanalyst uh, Max Eidingen, may have acted as a cutout between them and Moscow. The circumstantial evidence also includes the correspondence revealing her knowledge of Skoblin's work with Roves and his notebook containing an entry about his planned meeting with Miller on the day of the kidnapping. So because Plavitskaya's fate was determined by an all-male jury at a time when male chauvinism and xenophobia were prevalent, the prosecutor also adopted a strategy of emphasizing how she intimately knew about Skoblin's business intrigues and was the dominant partner in the couple. The prosecutor relied on the testimony of Skoblin's former brothers in arms from Roves, who painted her as the primary villain. In contrast, Plavitskaya claimed that she knew nothing and never confessed to being a spy. She swore that she was apolitical and had no control over her husband's decisions. Her defense attorneys argued that the prosecution had provided no evidence of her intention to kidnap Miller, her prior knowledge of the plot, or her participation in the act itself. They questioned the validity of Miller's note and tried to raise doubt in the jurors' minds as to whether the Soviets had in fact planned the kidnapping. Plavitskaya's final words at her trial were, I am an orphan, God alone attests to my innocence. The jurors though, were unconvinced by the defense's claims and all but one voted to find Plavitskaya guilty of aiding Miller's kidnappers. 
but they also acknowledged extenuating circumstances insofar as Miller's body was never found and she appeared not to have taken a physical part in his kidnapping. The jury had a range of options for sentencing from time served to 20 years hard labor. They chose to give Plavitskaya the harshest sentence based on the prosecutor's recommendation. The jurors had accepted the prosecutor's reasoning that the court needed to treat the case as a warning to all and any immigrants who might contemplate committing crimes on French soil. The Miller family won their lawsuit against Plavitskaya, but were, were awarded only one franc as a symbol of the damages. Scoblin was later found guilty in absentia of kidnapping Miller. The French government denied Plavitskaya's appeals and requests for clemency. In July 1939, she entered a woman's prison in Rennes, France. She told her defense attorney at the time, is this the end then? Is it true that nothing will save me now? Oh, I so want to live, so want to see flowers and the sun. Plavitskaya received few visitors in prison. One noteworthy exception was police commissioner Jean Valen who wrote in his memoirs about how she had partly confessed to him in May 1940, on the eve of the Germans' invasion of France. Plavitskaya told Belen that on the night of Mueller's kidnapping, Skoblin had confessed to her that he was involved and had betrayed the white Russian cause. Skoblin, she claimed, did not have enough time to tell her the whole story because he was forced to go to Rove's headquarters to explain his whereabouts that day and then, of course, disappeared. We should not accept Plavitskaya's confession to Belen as an accurate and full account of her knowledge. Even at this late date in May 1940, she was still seeking clemency. She admitted only to covering for Skoblin after the fact. Belen passed on her confession to his superiors who declined to take further action given that the Nazis had invaded France that very week. Within days of the Nazis arrival in Rennes, a Gestapo officer came to the prison to interrogate Plavitskaya, although we do not have a record of what was actually said during that interrogation. In Paris, the Nazis had already confiscated the police dossier related to the Miller kidnapping case. After her meeting with the Gestapo officer, Plavitskaya's health worsened. She was treated in the prison infirmary for congestive heart failure and an infected left foot, which doctors at a nearby hospital had to amputate. She returned to the prison where she died on September 21st, 1940. She was 61 years old. Rumors about the cause of her death spread, that the Soviets may have poisoned her, which was possible, or even that the Nazis had run her over with a tank which was implausible. The French reportedly performed an autopsy on her body, but I was unable to find a copy of that report. Her remains were likely buried in an unmarked grave on the prison grounds. In death, Plavitskaya served as the subject of a cautionary tale for homesick Russian emigres. Striking a deal with the Soviets did not necessarily lead to your safe return home and could even prove fatal. In 1943, Russian emigre writer Vladimir Nabokov published a satirical story based on her and Skoblin's life called The Assistant Producer. It serves as a monument to the poor and unethical choices they made in exile. Mueller's wife, Natalia, and the rest of Mueller's family suffered greatly due to his loss and Rove's never recovered as an anti-Soviet military organization. The Soviet government did not publicly admit that the NKVD had carried out Miller's kidnapping or that Skoblin and Plavitskaya were involved until the Gorbachev era. Plavitskaya's reputation in Russia has since been partly restored, although she's definitely no longer a household name. In, in 2009, a small museum opened in Vinikova that's dedicated to her memory. And I got to visit it in May, 2012. There's an exhibit about her life and various folk music events are held in the building's auditorium. Uh, during that time when I was visiting the museum, I got to meet its director, 
who's uh, in the, the center here in this photograph, uh, Vinikova's mayor, who's on her left, and then Vinikova's uh, school principal on, on the right. And behind them, you can see a statue of Plavitskaya uh, that is near the grounds of the museum in a, in a garden area there. And the statue was designed by Russian sculptor Vyacheslav uh, Klikov in 1998. So with that, I think I'll stop and end my presentation. And uh, of course, um, I'll be happy to take questions at this time. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Dr. Jordan, for a fascinating presentation. And I want to remind everyone that the book, uh, Stalin Singing Spy, is available on Amazon. So if you want uh, to find out more, and I certainly do, uh, I think this is just the tip of the iceberg of this story, <laughs> yes. please do go um, to Amazon and check out the book. Um, while Dr. Jordan is, is getting a bit of a break, um, please go ahead and submit your questions in the Q&A section and, or in the chat section. Um, and I wanted to also share with you one of the objects that is uh, somewhat related to uh, the presentation today. And if you'll allow me just a moment, I wanted to show you this icon of St. Nicholas, the Wonder Worker, which is a recent acquisition thanks to a generous donor who uh, bought it at an estate sale recently. Um, the interesting part about this icon is the inscription on the back. It turns out that this icon of St. Nicholas was presented to General uh, Pyotr Vrangil, who of course was mentioned many times during the presentation, um, and it was presented to him in 1920, July of 1920, by parishioners of a church in Militopol, which is uh, now in, in, in present-day Ukraine. And this was done after uh, one of the brilliant victories of the White uh, Army over the cavalry of the Red Army during the Civil War. So now this icon is in our collection. Um, excuse me. So here is the inscription on the back. It says, a blessing to the supreme um, leader and ruler of Russia, Baron Peter Nikolaevich Vrangil, from the parishioners of the St. Alexander Nevsky Cathedral. And you see the cathedral in the image below, dated July of 1920. So these are the kinds of objects that are coming into our collection, thanks to our generous donors. But I do want to, um, uh, to direct your attention to the condition of this piece. So as you can see, the Riza or the Eklad, the, the cover, the silver cover on the icon is in rather poor condition. It is falling off of, of the, um, it's disattached and coming off. So there is no way to exhibit this icon currently um, because it will simply disintegrate and fall apart. So as you may have guessed, I wanted to um, direct your attention to our spring appeal, which is continuing until June 30th. Uh, and I hope that all of you um, we'll make a donation to the Spring Appeal, whether it's $35, $50, $100, every donation makes a difference. And it's all going towards the conservation of pieces like this, which once they're conserved, will go uh, on exhibit and you will be able to enjoy them uh, displayed in our museum. So please go to our website, uh, click on that donate button. We are over 50% uh, of our $35,000 goal. Every dollar goes towards conservation of these wonderful objects that have fascinating stories behind them, as well as their preservation and care. So thank you to everyone who has come and attended this lecture today. Thank you to everyone who has been supporting our museum. I know there are um, multiple names among our audience today who have already made donations. Thank you so much for your support and have a wonderful weekend. Now uh, on to the questions and answers and I'm very much looking forward to finding out more about this topic. Thank you again. All right, so the good news is we already have many fantastic questions to work with. Uh, so thank you to our audience. Uh, I'll begin here by asking a few different questions in one. Uh, so our viewer Agnes asks, do any of her silent films that you mentioned survive? And Marie asks, um, did she speak or sing in any other languages besides Russian? So we'll get started there. Okay, well, thank you for your questions. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, so in terms of her films, I, I wish I, I could have spent time maybe in the Mosque film 
archive to try to find them. Uh, those two films that I had mentioned, the Gardein films, 1915, 1916, I've read that they were actually combined into one. Uh, but uh, I just, I don't know how to find any of them. And like I said, I didn't have a chance uh, to spend time in the film archives in Moscow trying to track those down. Um, so, and then the second one, did Plavitskaya sing in any other languages? In terms of my own research, it didn't seem to be the case. Um, I, I believe that she sang only in Russian, but if someone can track down <laughs> some other information for us to find out if she had recorded in any other language, that would be really interesting to me. So I'm sorry that I, I couldn't offer a fuller answer than that. It's just given my own research and about eight different archives and then meeting a Polovitskaya relative, Irina Raksha, um, you know, that I just didn't find anything other than just Russian language uh, performances on recordings. All right, wonderful, thank you. So keeping in line with this uh, idea of relatives and family, another viewer asks, did her surviving siblings leave or remain in Russia slash USSR after 1919? So that's a great question as well. Um, as far as what I could find, they remained in Russia, um, in uh, the Korsk area, um, several of them in, still in Vinikova. Um, I did not find that any of them left Russia. It might have been the case that some of them died during the famine. Um, you know, that, that of course it hit um, Ukraine, Ukraine the hardest, but also in other parts of, um, in Southern Russia. Um, so she may have lost some relatives during the famine, the late 20s, early 30s, uh, and then possibly as well during World War II. Um, now, I, I had mentioned about Plavitsky, her first husband, Edmund Plavitsky. Uh, he was um, living, he and his parents um, were actually living in her house for a little while, but then he remarried. Uh, and uh, he was living in Poland for a while, but he would visit her and Skoblin at their uh, house outside of Paris a few times too. And when he was asked uh, in 1937 or 38 whether or not he thought she was a spy, he said no. Um, of course, he was wrong. Uh, but he continued to defend her even long after their divorce, which is, I think, really interesting. All right, thank you. So keeping in line now with kind of World War II era, what is the fate of the French dossier on Miller that was seized by the Nazis? Uh, what happened to Miller's archive that was confiscated by French police? Mm. So yeah, Miller's archive, gosh, I, I didn't get to see it. Um, so um, I think at one point the Germans stole, I mean, I, I had mentioned that the Germans were really interested in the Mueller uh, kidnapping case. So they did, they tried to take as much as they could from uh, Paris, uh, from the Paris police archive. Uh, and uh, when they came in in 1940, um, I, I had thought that they carted them off um, somewhere for a while. And then the Soviets got them back. Uh, the uh, the French, I think, were able to retrieve some of these files. Uh, but when I when I was there in Paris uh, about 10 years ago or so, um, I did find file leftover files in the Paris police archives after having to meet with an archivist for a while. <laughs> I, and, uh, and then he gave them to me. Uh, but and there were just a lot of papers of, of um, kind of copies of uh, some of the statements that a number of Rove's officials gave as a part of the investigation, a lot of newspaper clippings uh, I took photographs of. And then I also, um, I needed to apply for access to the remaining files that are kept in the National Archives in Paris. Uh, so I was able to gain those and then um, a full copy of the transcript of the, the trial in December 1938. But in terms of Miller's papers, I, I, uh, I, I just didn't see them. It, I, I did not find them. If anyone knows where they are, I'd love to hear. <laughs> so. 
All right, so let's go to this question here from Anita, who asks, is Plavitskaya taught in Russian school curriculum uh, or has she been relegated to a historical footnote? Is there any theater, music school, anywhere that bears her name? What is kind of her enduring legacy here? Yeah, that's a great question as well. I mean, of course, as I mentioned, there's that museum in Vinikova dedicated to her. Um, as early as the late 70s, uh, musicologists wrote a book about uh, the early musical industry that talked about Estrada and included her as an Estrada uh, luminary. And that was like the beginning of her restoration, even in the Soviet period. Of course, they said nothing about her involvement in the Mueller kidnapping at that point. Um, and, uh, but in terms of her being taught more widely, in Russian schools, that I'm not sure of, unfortunately. I, I did a kind of an informal canvassing around town when I was in Kursk. It's just kind of funny. I would walk into stores and I'd talk with people, um, you know, some young women who were uh, personing a store, like salespeople or something. I said, hey, have you heard of Plavitskaya? Did you learn about her in school? They had no idea. So this was back in 20, uh, 2012 when I was there. Um, so, um, so I'm not sure at this point, um, maybe a little bit more, uh, especially now that there's a museum. And I think in Kursk as well, there in, in the actual city of Kursk, there's a competition, um, a singing competition that's named after Plavitskaya. Thank you. So getting into two audience questions here, um, Agnes writes, she did seem to lean czarist white army. Did she spy for the Soviets just for money? And then Grace follows up and says, what do you think her motivation was to be a Soviet spy? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, yeah, so that's of course the kind of the center of, of my exploration of her because I am a political scientist and I'm, I'm an historian, but political historian. Uh, so I'm always curious about those questions. Uh, and I, I think on the one hand, she really did try to remain apolitical. She was self-interested for sure. Uh, I think she just want, she really truly wanted to get back to, to Russia uh, to renew the glory of her uh, days as uh, Russia's top uh, female folk singer. So I think she had very selfish intentions, uh, was weak in that way. Uh, and uh, and uh, her husband, you know, Skoblin seemed very resentful, increasingly resentful of Mueller and of um, the other uh, top white Russian army officers who had suspected him of treachery. Uh, and they were told by the Soviets that that once back in the Soviet Union, he would serve in the Red Army. Uh, so when they signed on to become Soviet agents, they were told that they would have amnesty, they would go back to Russia, and um, that that Skoblin and, and that they were spying for the Red Army, which they actually weren't. Um, in reality, they weren't. So they were, um, you know, so it was mischaracterized what what they were doing in the first place. So I don't think she necessarily was a Bolshevik communist at heart. I think she was pro Plavitskaya at heart. Sure, thank you. Fantastic. And that actually leads into our next question from Natalie, who was uh, a former presenter here from Second Saturday. So hello to Dr. Natalie Zelensky in the crowd. Uh, she writes, thank you for a fascinating lecture. Could you tell us more about the political influence Plavitskaya had on Skoblin early on in their relationship and the possible impetus behind this. Was there a definitive turning point towards the red cause? And I know you kind of get into this question a little bit in your um, last response here, mm. but anything else? Or? Yeah, I, you know, I don't feel comfortable acting self-confident in an answer. Uh, for all of the materials I looked at and I went into eight different archives, you know, including the Hoover at Stanford and, and uh, the archives I mentioned in uh, France. And so I just don't know exactly. I, she, she had a very powerful personality. She was no doubt influential uh, on Skoblin. 
uh, but Scoblin had his own reasons to feel resentful and angry and to turn against his superiors. Um, so I think they just mainly really wanted to get back to Russia. She felt like she, she just could not assimilate into a culture outside of Russia. She wanted to return to her glory. I just, I didn't find anything um, in any of her writings or anything where she spoke highly about Bolshevism, about communism per se. I think she cared a lot about her family and about um, the people she knew in Kursk and in Vinikova. She cared, she did care that they would be kept alive um, a lot. Uh, and if in fact she did have a child, which like I said, I didn't have, sorry, the phone's going off. I didn't have any documented evidence of that, but if in fact she did have a child that she had to leave behind, that would have been the, the very best reason for her wanting to return to her homeland. So I, I wish I could feel more confident about an answer. Mm. It was one of the, my failures. <laughs> in in this project, you know, and it's the problem with wanting to write a biography about a spy. Hmm. That's a very good point. Yeah. Uh, so I think I'll leave things here with a very last question. Uh, thank you to everyone who submitted questions and attended today. Uh, but Charles writes, Professor Jordan, I greatly enjoyed your book and applaud the writing and research you put into this work. Uh, what aspect of your research into Plavitskaya's life in exile did you find most challenging? Uh, and further, did you learn anything unexpected about her life and exile while doing your research? Thank you. Thank you for reading my book and uh, for asking that really thoughtful question. Um, so what what in my research into Plavitskaya's life and exile do I find most challenging? Um, you know, I, I had copies of her memoirs that I could use to to help me rebuild her childhood, but in her early adult years until 1915. After that, I was dealing with all these rumors and I had to weigh them and think about the biases of um, the people who, who um, held, these, held these views. Um, and so I was constantly trying to figure out what I could say, how best to say it. Uh, when I didn't know for sure. So I spend a lot of time in the book talking about these various rumors and kind of weighing their strengths and their weaknesses and talking about kind of the probability of what's most likely. Um, and, and it was really hard, <laughs> really hard. Uh, and then uh, did I learn anything I expected about her life in exile uh, during my research? Um, I guess it was just um, the the fact that she still, despite, I think she had a lot of uh, health problems, physical and mental, and she still was able to perform at such a high level, like what you heard um, with that recording with uh, Rachmaninoff. Um, she still loved to sing. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, I, she, I mean, she tried to come across as authentic while lying, while being deceptive for years and years and years, uh, which is something I, mean, I, I tried to think about, um, you know, as, as uh, some, I, I sing a little bit myself, but not on her level at all. I performed, uh, and uh, so I think about the term authenticity and how she was able to live with herself for so long. Um, meeting with members of the Russian immigration, you know, from London to uh, Eastern Europe to the United States, well, in the US, maybe she wasn't a spy yet at that point, um, and deceiving so many people around her who relied on her to help them build their sense of identity and belonging in exile. Um, and then also I got to know more about Miller and his wife. And I just think about the suffering that his wife had gone through and his family. So those are some of the things. <laughs> that I thought about when I was um, doing my research on the book. Thank you. Well, again, a final thank you, uh, Dr. Jordan. We really appreciate this lecture topic. And to our audience, be on the lookout for uh, news regarding next month's second Saturday lecture presented by Doug Smith. Uh, we also have an upcoming live stream program from the museum, and we will be in touch with more details. So. 
I hope that you all are enjoying your morning, afternoon, evening, etc. And thank you for joining us for another fantastic second Saturday lecture series. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.